Yeah. Look animated. <laughs> You're welcome. Thank you. So, yeah, that must have been quite a challenge. My, my daughter works with um, mentally challenged uh, homeless individuals. Okay. That's very, she's had some, I'm very proud, but I'm also kind of scared for her because she's had yeah. some really, really dicey situations. Uh, yeah. She's now been is assaulted. She, hmm? Is she working at a shelter? or? She was, and now she's with a... Um, kind of a uh, a team uh, it's a group that swoops into shelters that need help with problem cases okay so she um, and that's preferable to her she's really like that but so she's all over the place and um, the shelter situation was not a good that was tough it was tough I, I so admire <coughs> people who go into that line of work you know I think sometimes the stuff that we do here there, there's almost there's always like an end to it right right but with social work no. the problem it just never yeah, ends yeah it's and tough it's, yeah I said to you right? I said it's, it's so needed it's so necessary people don't realize the value yeah of well at least they make the big bucks you know <laughs> that's true yeah yeah the red card yeah the whole wow thing. Yeah. yeah I keep telling her if you know, you got to find a boyfriend who's down on Wall Street quickly because <laughs> dad can't keep doing <laughs> But I, t you know, I tell her, I give her, you know, I help her out, but she, and she feels guilty. But I said, you know, I, I could give it to a charity or I could funnel it through you. It's all good things, right? Either way, right? Anyway, how long has your daughter been doing it? Um, I, was it prior to COVID? She, she must have been doing it prior. Yeah, she, she's already she licensed, was, dude. Yeah, she, she worked uh, in, in Maryland in a while, but then she, she's always wanted to live in New York. Yeah. She, you know, little girl, like, I'm going to go off and yeah. live in New York. I'm, okay, well, she did, so, and... Uh, well, yeah. maybe maybe we can get our girls together sometime. How, how old is she? She is 26. Oh, yeah, she'll same be age. 26 in December. Same age, the yeah. whole thing. Yeah. Wow, yeah. interesting. Yeah, this is so rough when I said they should meet each other. Yeah, yeah it's too bad she should have come. <laughs> oh well. But you should introduce them. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, it's a hard damn job, I'll tell you. We're live. Do you have the sound on? Mm -hmm. But she loves it, right? Yeah, and well, now she started this new job, and so far she's really liking it because she is actually interacting. With she's with seeing people, which helps. Yeah. So she, yeah. kind of, she must have been kind of miserable there for a while. Well, was yeah. she alone in the city, or did she have a pretty good network of Well, she, people? I mean, her boyfriend is up oh, here, and, okay. and she, made, she makes friends from relatively... Right.
Oh, good to know. Thank you. Good thing I didn't go somewhere else. This is vodka. Yeah. <laughs> Improve the conversation, don't you think? Yeah. No worries. No problems. Yeah, this is me. Yeah. I'm, I'm too fisty. Sure, that might have been a hand. I think it was a hand, yeah. Can I pull your refill, sir? Yes, yeah, sir. Yeah, yeah. Double? Yeah. Oh, did I? I didn't put it on. No, 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 we're good. We're right, good. That could have yeah. been bad. Yeah. That's why I actually was happening. Yeah. I. <coughs> Hello, everyone. Okay, this is a great way to start off. Right on time, and we're all ready to go. Full house. 
Well, welcome back to the Explorers Club Monday Night Lecture Series, the first of the fall season. It's been a long time, but we're thrilled to see you with or without masks, sitting in the audience here or watching at home. The Explorers Club has become the place to be. In fact, Discovery Plus has just started streaming an all new series, Tales from the Explorers Club, where Josh Gates gives viewers exclusive access to the archives of our legendary club and historic expeditions that changed our knowledge of the world. I hope you can all watch when you have the time. We have an exceptional lineup for events coming up for you, and we hope you can join us by watching live or on YouTube or Facebook channels where everything is now archived. Thank you to Luis and, and Alex, our AV experts. In the Explorers Club tradition, we try to bring you briefings on the most recent and cutting edge explorations. And I can't think of anything more current than the Webb Telescope that continues to make exciting news, which brings us to tonight's program. Here to host our evening, as some of you all know, Miles O'Brien, an independent journalist who focuses on science, technology, and aerospace. He's a science correspondent for PBS NewsHour, a producer, director, writer, and correspondent for the PBS documentary programs Nova and Frontline, and an aviation analyst for CNN. Please welcome Miles and Eric. Miles, take it away. Thank you, Anne. Appreciate it. Thank you. Wow. Greetings, explorers. Good to see you all. You know, uh, when I think about this club, I think about flags and footprints. And that is one brand of exploring that we tend to think about quite a bit here. Uh, but there's also, human beings have the ability to uh, project virtual footprints, virtual flags, and in this case, virtual eyes much farther than we can travel uh, on our own. And that's what we're talking about tonight. So uh, our guest here is every bit as much an adventurer as somebody who has summited Everest. Uh, and if you think that uh, it's not a risky business, um, remember what happened with the Hubble Space Telescope initially, right? It's a, it can go south. And this particular instrument, um, the fact that it is working a million miles away from us now is uh, really uh, against all odds. 341 single points of failure, 341 ways this device could have gone south on its way to the Lagrange point, this place in space where the gravity is just right and where it can peer out and see much farther uh, than ever before and much further deep into time. It's an extraordinary time we live in. This is a golden age of astronomy like no other. And we're alive, and I hope you're appreciating that, uh, starting with Hubble and now with its not successor, but uh, it is it, its partner in space exploration, the Webb Space Telescope. Our guest is intertwined in these programs. He's one of the leading astrophysicists at NASA. He has origins at the Goddard Space Flight Center. If you're familiar with that, that's where Hubble is flown and where Webb is. Uh, an extraordinary place. He's worked as on um, the science programs for both Hubble and Webb and is totally OG when it comes to web. I mean, 19, 1996, I mean, that he, and he has got war stories complete uh, to tell you about how it got to be where it is today. This was no easy project. It came in late, it came in over budget, but that's what you get when you're inventing things on the fly, right? And nothing succeeds like success, and we're now basking in just the beginning years of the success of the Webb Space Telescope. So. Um, Please give a warm welcome to the program scientist, former program manager, and I can give you a host of other things in his resume, but you can Google that. Please welcome Dr. Eric Smith. So before you start, I just, I just want to say, you know, this idea that we're in this golden era. Uh, did you, when you got in this business of astrophysics, did you have any idea what lied ahead? I mean, did you know we were on the cusp of something great? I knew we were going to be doing space telescopes. I was trained as a ground-based observer. In fact, the very first job I had as an astronomer, as an undergraduate, was uh, working, taking glass plates in a telescope that was commissioned in 1896. Wow. So I started there 
but I knew when I was coming out of graduate school that we were going to be going into space, and we have done so tremendously successfully. So, yeah, I'm just, I'm lucky coming around this time. Well, yeah. if an astrophysicist on web doesn't share some images, we are, we have not, we have, didn't get our money's worth. So get busy. Let's see, <laughs> let's see what you got this. Uh, are we okay? Can you, can you hear him okay in the back? Is, yeah. is it okay on the mic? Does it sound right, okay? Me, I, excellent. Great. Okay. Okay. So, uh, as you pointed out, Miles, this is uh, the world's newest vehicle for deep space space exploration. We can't go there physically, but we can take ourselves there via instruments like Webb. So, in fact, we build telescopes for uh, a number of reasons. Here you see four different images. The top left is an X-ray image uh, of the Crab Pulsar. It was first known by humans in 1054. It exploded, but this is what it looks like in X-rays. The top right shows us an infrared view uh, of a star uh, that is sending shock waves through dust. And then the two bottom images are Hubble uh, image of a uh, planetary nebula. We'll see that later on with Webb's view. And the bottom uh, right picture is an infrared telescope Spitzer, a visible instrument Hubble. Webb is kind of the ancestor of both of those, and the X-ray is in there. So we need all these different wavelengths to explore space and tell us about uh, the phenomenon that are there. But the main reason we built Webb and why it looks the way it does is because of what we didn't see in this picture. This was the deepest view of the universe that we had from the most capable telescope for doing that, Hubble. And what astronomers looked for in this picture was the first galaxies to form after the Big Bang, signs of the newest galaxies that could have formed, and they didn't see it. So that told us we need to build a different type of telescope than Hubble. It had to have some characteristics that let it see things that are invisible in this kind of picture. So uh, we're going to take our medicine a little early. We're going to do a little physics here. Uh, wait one second. Yeah. I want to okay. get, let's get one point across. There's okay. some young people here. In yeah. I don't want to insult this crowd. These are some of the smartest people on the planet. But the, the relationship between time and distance is a very key thing. It's an important point to get across. When we, talk, when we look far, we look deep into time. That's right. Uh, because space is so large, even light uh, at its you know, 186,000 miles a second takes time to traverse the vast distances. So we are necessarily looking back in time when we look farther out. Uh, so many studies in astronomy are statistical, therefore, because we can't say, <clears throat> I want to see a galaxy at a certain age. We have to look at a certain distance, and that will tell us when the light came from there. And that, in fact, is a good segue uh, into our little physics lesson here. Uh, and so uh, we'll get through this quickly. There will be a quiz. Yeah. Take notes. So, so what you see up on, up on the screen here is uh, what's called a, a black body curve. It's uh, essentially the measure of how much energy is coming out as a function of wavelength down here for, uh, you know, most common stars in the galaxy, and that has a peak here around one micron or just a little bit short of that. So our eyes uh, run out to about 0.8 microns visible. Now, uh, because when we look out in space, we look back in time, as things uh, go far, as you look farther back, astronomers, uh, you know, completely counterintuitively call this redshift, and they give it the variable z. And uh, so if you look back uh, earlier in the universe, you get higher redshifts, and that is things that are farther away from you. The light has taken longer. So that tells us if we want to see things far away, we need to build an infrared telescope, and Hubble was visible. The other phenomenon that this expansion of the universe, the stretching of light to redden it, uh, does is it dims the light. So an object... Uh, at a redshift of 10 is much fainter, that same object, so we need to have a bigger telescope. So this one graph here tells you the basic parameters of how Webb uh, needed to be different than Hubble. It needed to be an infrared telescope, and it needed to be bigger than Hubble. Uh, one other benefit, if you're going to have an infrared telescope, is that you can study cooler objects in space. 
That first blue curve was for something around 3,000 degree, 3,000 Kelvin. But if you go farther into the infrared, you can study cooler objects, and that comes into play when we study stars. So we want to look back in time to see farther than Hubble did. Uh, this little chart here it graphically depicts how far back Hubble was able to see uh, towards the first galaxies to form after the Big Bang. And if we just change the axis on the top, let me click that once. Let me try again. There. Uh, so Hubble has seen galaxies that are 400 million years, they formed 400 million years after the Big Bang. Yet those galaxies have second generation stars in them. They weren't the first things to form. So we need to see back to around 200 million years. And so that's how we, that's what we built Webb to do. Of course, it's a general purpose observatory, so we'll be able to do many different things. But this was really the thing that drove the designs for Webb. All right, so quick question, though, before we get into the engineering here. Yeah. Is it possible uh, to see the Big Bang? Uh, we can see the remnant of the Big Bang, and we have, in fact, and that is the three-degree background, the 2.7 Kelvin background that is visible in a microwave. So there have been microwave satellites that have seen this, the remnant of the Big Bang, but that's not stars or galaxies. It's too uh, dense. In other words, you're not, you can't make out anything in that? It's, well, it's very diffuse. If you look at maps of it, it looks like a mottled surface. It's, it's, it's kind of beautiful in a way, but there's the distinct structures in it are much larger than any structures of galaxies. And it's the material where light has just separated from protons and electrons. There aren't even atoms yet. And what we don't know in the universe is how did the universe go from this hot sea of photons, electrons, and protons into structures that we see around us today. So basically, Webb gets us to kind of the nurseries, the early planet and star formation. That, that's an excellent way to think about it. We have family history pictures of, say, birth, and then we have a teenager. Something's happened in between there, and, and we need to see those pictures. We need the puberty telescope. That's what we need. That's yeah. next. You're going to work yeah. on that one. Yeah, right. one of the names rejected. <laughs> All right. Yeah. So uh, I just put this up here. Uh, I'm not going to talk to the numbers, but f uh, for those who like to think about engineering details, here's a comparison uh, of Hubble and Webb. And uh, Hubble, of course, is a telescope like we're all familiar with. It's a tube. It, it looks like a telescope. Uh, Webb looks like uh, a wicked alien spaceship. And uh, I think that's actually part of the reason it, it enjoys such popularity is that it's a beautiful thing uh, that does amazing science. But this has some of the statistics of the size and the operating temperatures. And we can talk more about those temperatures when we talk about where it sits in space. Uh, so as Miles said, let's talk a little bit uh, about the engineering aspect. Uh, this was not an easy telescope to build. Uh, I can remember some of the first original drawings where it was sketched up and it, it, looked, it looked pretty simple back then. Uh, but as you realize the technology you need to invent to even make it, uh, that's part of the reason Webb took uh, as long as it did to develop. So let's talk about some of the key features uh, of the design. Uh, this, this little graphic to show you how the telescope is working. Uh, it, it's a, uh, we call it a three uh, mirror anastigmat uh, telescope. So the light comes in, hits that big gold primary, bounces up to the secondary that sits out in front, and then it goes down through that uh, tube that sticks out in the middle of the mirror uh, into some fold mirrors and actual little adjusting mirrors that we can move very fast to track objects. And then it goes back into the science instruments. Uh, so that's just uh, the telescope itself. Uh, inside that instrument package, there are four distinct instruments built by NASA and its international partners. That's another really critical thing about Webb is that it takes a planet to build a telescope like this, uh, and we'll talk about that uh, later. Now, here are just some other uh, interesting things that, uh, you know, as an astronomer, I found these technological achievements pretty uh, amazing. That uh, black lattice-like structure you see, it's a, 
It's a graphite composite structure made of little thin sheets of graphite that they lay out and glue up, uh, and then they uh, cure them and they become rigid, and they become rigid enough that they move less than one ten thousandths of human hair's width as it changes temperature and as it uh, you know, sits in space. So it holds things incredibly stable, and that's part of the reason why Webb works as so well. Is, is that one of the inventions, by the way, or is that something you bought off the shelf? Uh, can you get that at Home Depot? Uh, you cannot get this yeah. at Home Depot. Okay. Uh, well, you probably can for like $10 billion. <laughs> you can go to that aisle. Uh, in fact, one of the things that had to be invented for this was new ways to glue material. Oh, wow. So this was, a, this was a, like one of those industry spin-offs that, you know, it doesn't make it into your household, but we taught this, the composite industry, new ways to glue things for uh, ultra-stability. Uh, of course, the other really iconic thing, there's the gold mirror, and there's the sun shield, that big silver sun shield. You can see the scale of it uh, here with the little, little people on it. It's about the size of a tennis court, and those five layers uh, reject heat from the sun, reject light from the sun, to the equivalent of an SPF of uh, 10 million. And as someone who has to wear a lot of sunscreen, <laughs> I really appreciate that. There's another spinoff for you. Yeah. <laughs> it has to be really cold, right? Yes. Otherwise uh, it sees itself? Yeah, because it's an infrared telescope, infrared is heat. And if the telescope is too warm, then what it's detecting is its own radiation. And so we need to keep it cold so we have a sun shield and we also send it far from Earth to keep it away from the heat uh, that the Earth uh, reflects uh, and generates. So I think let's flip over to the next one. And that sun shield deployment, that was where you really were sweating bullets, right? That was the trickiest of all the right. uh, deployments because it's essentially a sail. It works on pulleys and lines just like your, your sailboat uh, would do. Uh, and uh, to release that sun shield, of course, you, here you see it uh, unfolded uh, out at Northrop Grumman in uh, California. This was the most it was ever deployed on Earth. Uh, there are 178 of those 340 some uh, single point failures, 178 actuators, uh, little pistons that were held by a nut uh, that threaded through the folded up sun shield and they all had to fire at exactly the same time and release the wires that held the split nut were burned. The, the spring let go, the split nut let release, the tension on the rod pulled it down, and the sun shield could unfold. What could go wrong with that, right? <laughs> Holy cow. And that's basically not unlike a mylar balloon, you know, a helium balloon. It's, it's ca Kapton is cap material. Yeah. Cap Kapton is a material. It's about a little thinner than a plastic baggie. Um, yeah. Wow. It's coated with uh, vapor deposit aluminum. That's what get, makes it silver. The uh, bottom two most layers have a, uh, another coating on them. They're pinkish uh, to help reject uh, heat from the sun. Uh, but uh, actually a great story during deployment, uh, there were covers that covered that sun shield that were part of the release and they were uh, rolled up with little springs, Kapton springs, uh, and they fired those release mechanisms and the covers rolled back and then there was supposed to be a switch. When they kind of flipped over the edge, they would hit a switch and say, I'm deployed. Three of them went. And the fourth one didn't say, I'm deployed. Uh oh. So a thermal engineer on the commissioning team realized that if that folded back the way it should, that one of their thermal sensors would now be blocked. And so he could predict what temperature he should see if it rolled back and got in the way. And, and he did, so he said, yeah, it, it's deployed. I love stuff like that. That's what you guys <laughs> live for, right? <laughs> so uh, there it is uh, uh, deployed on Earth, but where does it sit in space? And so this is a little animation uh, that shows, you'll see the telescope uh, flying by here in a second. It's, it's yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. Oop, it jumped there, wow. Well, no, it's, it's moving. Oh, it's going back. Yeah, you're good. Yeah. 
So uh, actually, I'm going to step away for a second here. So you can see it's a million miles from Earth, again, to help it cool down so that it can uh, get to the coldness it needs to. And it orbits about that L2 point. It doesn't stay stationary. It does this enormous orbit that's actually three times larger than the distance between the Earth and the moon. So it's a huge orbit it's doing uh, out there so we can always talk to the telescope. Uh, here you can see a little animation of how it scans through the sky. It looks in a direction perpendicular to the axis that points back to the sun. And there's the part you were talking about earlier, Miles, with the hot side and the cold side where all the scientific instrumentation lies. Uh, Hubble is very close to Earth. It's going in and out of the Earth's sh uh, uh, shadow uh, every 90 minutes. Uh, and so it, it's getting a lot of thermal pulses. We are in a constant thermal bath, so it's very stable. You combine that with those thermal structures that we built means that the, the whole telescope is very rigid. Now we can move a little bit uh, about the roll axis and the yaw axis, and then what this gives us is an annulus in the sky that we can scan. And so over the course of the year, we can see every part of the sky. And there are some parts we can see all the time. And this spot is good for fuel consumption too, right? Because it, it doesn't require as much rocket burning to keep it in that place. Right. Uh, these Lagrange points are semi-stable point. This is a semi-stable point in uh, the gravitational field of the Earth and the Sun. And so we follow the Earth around. And we don't need to use much fuel for station keeping. Uh, in fact, our launch was so perfect that um, the amount of fuel we anticipated we were going to need for station keeping, uh, we'll probably have enough to run for not five years, but more like 20 to 25 years. So, All right. Yeah. That's good. Go yeah. France. Yeah. All right. So uh, speaking of France, let's, let's, uh, let's watch the next thing. And this is a little animation about the launch itself. And it starts with an elevator ride. Um, down in Karoo, uh, the European Space Agency provided the launch with their most reliable vehicle, the Ariane 5. And so here we're uh, riding an elevator up past, uh, you can see that we're going alongside the solid rocket booster. Uh, it's the, the closest piece to us. Now you're passing the center uh, the liquid rocket, and their web sits atop. This is shortly before we launched. And now you'll see they, they put us uh, on the rocket this way. And then this is actually one of the scary things. They put the shroud down over top of this. And our clearance is it's, it's an inch or something. So this was... Uh, Were you there for that? I was, I was there for that. And that was, yeah, that was, that was a nail biter. Yeah. <laughs> So then, uh, like many of these things, we had a nice ride out, and of course, it is in—it's in the rainforest. There's a lot of rain. So and we have an start. And lift off. Decollage. Decollage. Lift off from a tropical rainforest to the edge of time itself. James Webb begins a voyage back to the birth of the universe. It was waving goodbye. James Webb Space Telescope amidst yeah. applause here in the Mission Control Center, now taking its first steps in pursuit of cosmological discovery. All right, Eric, you've got to tell me, why isn't there a camera on the telescope so we can see the telescope? Uh, you know, just, just look at it, see what it's doing, right? <laughs> Yeah, there's, a, there's an old saying we have, if it's not required, it's yeah. forbidden. <laughs> uh, yeah. when, uh, when Webb was uh, conceived, it was before the, uh, we knew about the small cameras that we now have uh, on all the missions. You could have found room for a GoPro, right? 
But th that camera and the, the view it gave us, uh, and the fact that we saw the deployment of the sun shield, um, so the solar array, told us that the placement from the Ariane 5 was so precise that we didn't have to run a loop that would have had our own telescope correcting us where we needed to be in, a, in the three-dimensional velocity space and position to get where we wanted to go. The, the observatory said, you know, am, am I close to this? And it said, oh, I'm right on it. Boom. Well, so I remember watching it, and th that was actually earlier than you expected. For by, th by three minutes. Yeah, and so I thought, oh, boy, they're in trouble. You know, that just goes to show you how journalists think, right? <laughs> and you're like, yeah, and I'm like, oh, no, this could be bad. I mean, yeah, yeah, that, that, that was a, the first sign that uh, Ariane had done an amazing job yeah. with the fact that that went off exactly uh, as when it did. And, and the news just kept getting better yeah. from then. Uh, uh, so I mentioned that this is a, a project that the world is involved in, and this little map shows the, all the contributions from the United States. There were 29 states and the District of Columbia that had involvement in this, 14 countries in Europe, and of course Canada. Uh, just to mention, uh, Europe gave us that amazing ride, and they built one and a half science instruments. The, that's our main spectrograph and a part of the, our mid-infrared, the instrument that looks farthest in the infrared. Uh, and Canada built the uh, fine guidance sensor, the camera that locks us onto a target. I always like to say our Canadian neighbors keep us stable. And uh, they also. And they're very polite about it, too. <laughs> uh, and they also built another science instrument, which is another great story. They originally had uh, a kind of instrument called the tunable filter they were going to put on web. And they worked on it for many years. And then, with about a year or two to go, they said, you know, we're, this, this isn't going to work. And uh, they said, we have another idea. And we thought, well, okay. GoPro, go for it. Right? They said GoPro. No, <laughs> it was, wasn't a GoPro, but it was something that they now call the Near Infrared Imager and Splitless Spectrograph. They pulled it off. It's designed to help us do exoplanet science, and it works amazing. So It's worth pointing out here that yeah. when Webb was conceived of back in the olden days, when you were a very young man, <laughs> uh, we didn't know about exoplanets yet. And so this is really not an exoplanet hunter. However, you might be able to find them, right? We can certainly study them with Webb, and, and you're absolutely right. Uh, I like to say Webb was started before exoplanets existed. Of course, they were there. We just didn't know about them. And in fact, I think in 96, we knew of two mm -hmm. exoplanets, and of course, now there's thousands. Uh, so Webb, while it was designed to do that deep universe science, it has capabilities that will be very powerful for studying uh, exoplanets. And we'll see some of that when we start talking about uh, some of the things that come back from Webb. So the thing that told us or gave us the first uh, hint of just how good this was was an image that was released here, and it shows if you could somehow get into the instrument cavity of Webb and look through the eyepiece of all the instruments and look at the Magellanic clouds, this is what you, and, and your eyes could see in the infrared, this is what you would see. And all of these uh, images were uh, better than the optical performance we spec'd it. Uh, in fact, it's more or less twice as good as we uh, required it. And uh, I attribute that to the unbelievably uh, fantastic job our systems engineering team and the folks at Northrop Grumman did, the care that they took putting this together, and something that people don't often appreciate, contamination control. That telescope doesn't have anything to protect the mirrors. So the whole time it's sitting out there for years, you know, earthly dust is getting on it. So we had a team that was constantly keeping it clean, uh, and they did a fantastic job. And that's part of the reason why the, the images are so pristine. So when you saw those images, you probably have a little PTSD over the first Hubble images, <laughs> which were, of course, very yeah. out of focus, and it was a very embarrassing moment. Uh, we, I, well, compare what it was like being in the control room from that event to this one when it came in like that. Uh, it, it, my reaction to this was pretty much the same as uh, when we see some of these later images. I, I just sort of giggled because it was like, I, it can't be this good. This is ridiculous. <laughs> you know? uh, so I, I knew it would work. Uh, people 
talk about the single point failures and uh, I was confident it would work because I knew the people who were behind it and, and made this an amazing thing. What I didn't think was that it would work so perfectly and exceed its requirements the way it has. Of course, it's way too far away for an astronaut to go repair it, as we became accustomed to during Hubble. So that really raised the bar in so many ways for you, didn't it? It meant that we had to have a much more extensive testing program, and we had to build in um, redundancy and the ability to back motors up. If you tried to deploy something that didn't work, you had to be able to back it up as, as opposed to running it in just one direction. Uh, but mainly it was just test, 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 test. And that's part of the reason why it took so long. All right, we probably should get to some images. Yeah. yeah. So We're bearing the lead here. Yeah, right? we, <laughs> we did all this stuff so we could take pictures like this. Um, this is another one of the planetary nebula, so it's a dying star. Uh, the picture on the left is the, what we call a near-infrared image, and for, uh, for us, near-infrared means the wavelengths run from uh, about 0.6 microns to 5 microns, so a little bit where your eye works, but mainly in the near-infrared. Then the picture on the right is the mid-infrared, which is from 5 microns to 28 microns. It sees cooler things. But the most amazing thing in this picture is that all the ejecta you see are not coming from this star, which is visible in the infrared, but from that star, which is only visible in the mid-infrared. Uh, so here, I mean, look, look at that. You, you, you can't see it there at all. So that's telling us about the temperature uh, of this star. And uh, you can see the waves of ejecta as the, that dying star uh, is pulsing its uh, outer layers of the atmosphere. And this is a binary system, so those two uh, are in orbit about one another. But you didn't know it was binary until you saw this, right? Well, we, kn we, we knew it was binary, it, but, seen it. but we hadn't seen it. Uh, and uh, now I, I was an extragalactic astronomer by training, so this is a beautiful picture. But one thing that caught my eye was this guy right here. That's an edge-on galaxy. I love that one. Cool. Yeah. Very cool. So let's take a look at another one. And these were part of the, the first images that this is were back released. In July, when this was, was yeah, July 12th. Uh, so this was a, a, a group of galaxies known as Stefan's Quintet. And there are five galaxies in it, but only four of them are at the same distance. The one on the leftmost is hundreds of light years closer. And in fact, you can see resolved stars in this galaxy. And if you were to blow this up, if you had it on your own screen, and by the way, you can download all these data and, and look at them uh, on your own screen. You can see individual stars in this galaxy. Uh, these five uh, are in a group. Uh, these two are interacting. They're colliding in that process. They stir up. Uh, the dust clouds and they make new stars in them. Uh, and most of the material you see here is where new stars are being made in the, in the dust that was in those uh, spiral galaxies. This is that same group, but now just the mid-infrared. We've taken the near-infrared uh, data away, and you can see the structures are much more chaotic. This is mainly the dust that you're seeing. The mid-infrared is very good at picking up uh, uh, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons. Uh, the chemical. Easy for you to say. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but that's the dust. Uh, that uh, you see in these uh, images. Well, you know, I've got to ask you a question, because yeah. all that dust is uh, intrinsically beautiful. But for scientists, you're like, you want to get it out of the way, don't you, right? Uh, for some studies, you're right. Yeah. You, want, yeah. you want to see through yeah. it, and the right. mid-infrared does that. But it's also where we form stars, so there are other people who like the uh, okay. Yeah, they're all about the dust. Okay, so, yeah. all right. Let's check it. <laughs> uh, in addition to taking beautiful pictures, we have spectra. We can split the light. Uh, that comes to us from these objects, just like a, a rainbow or a prism, and see the signatures of individual elements or uh, molecules. Uh, in this case, it's just elements we're seeing in that topmost galaxy in Stefan's Quintet, which is an active galaxy. So it has a black hole at the center. The black hole is eating material that's spiraling into it. Uh, 
and it's, uh, it's you know, emitting a tremendous amount of energy as that material spirals in and heats up. And this spectrum shows you, you know, iron, argon, neon that you can see uh, in this kind of system. And could, could this be yeah. used on exoplanets to uh, identify potential uh, ingredients for life? It certainly can, and in fact, we have a spectrum coming up where we'll talk just a bit about that. So, yeah, excellent lead in there. To live in. Yeah. Now, now this this is one of the. This is I just think, so stunning, right? Yeah. This is, this is the cover of a textbook, right? The, the, this was another one of those images when uh, this one I was sort of speechless when I saw yeah. this the first time because. Is that real? It, yeah. This is, this is a real image. This is a real image. It's moving, isn't it? Uh, of. Yeah. Uh, a cloud where hot stars up here, actually off the top of the screen, are the intense ultraviolet radiation is eating away at this dust cloud down below, destroying it, compressing it, and when it does that, it compresses it and new stars start to form along the ridge. Uh, and in fact, the very sharpness of this ridge, it really looks three-dimensional. It's due to those polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons right along the edge. Boy, space is a tough neighborhood, right? You know? <laughs> we think of starry, starry night. It's like starry, starry knife fight up there. Right? You know, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. It is, uh, it's a life or death business. Yeah, it really is. Stars, so. yeah. Uh, and, and I don't think you can quite see it on this projection, but one of these uh, systems over here in fact, you can sort of see this here. It looks a little like an explosion or, or blowout here. There's a newly forming star that has ejected material, and there, just off, off this image here, you, there is a little cloud that has blown out wow. uh, from that star. How were you able to connect that? Uh, so people who had done radio observations uh, were, could tell, you know, this was the, you know, the jet was pointed in this direction, and you trace it back. Very cool. Now, a picture like this is the reason we more or less built Webb. Uh, this is a deep universe picture. We took this during the, the so-called commissioning process. We were practicing with the telescope, getting ready. This picture is the deepest picture of the universe ever taken by humans and we weren't even trying. <laughs> and and it, it's worth pointing out, if, it, with previous instruments, that would just be a black patch of sky, right? More or you, less? You would see... Or would you see a little bit? You, you would see this galaxy yeah. cluster in the center and some of these arcs, but what you wouldn't see are most of these little things in the background. So this is all brand new stuff. All brand new. Uh, we, we knew this was a, a galaxy cluster, uh, that's the system here, but you can see these arcs are uh, images of galaxies much farther away from us than the cluster. And as the light comes near that cluster, the gravity well of that cluster, the visible matter and the dark matter, bend and magnify that light, and it stretches it out. So there are some of these, like this thing and that thing, those are the same galaxy. Uh, but its light is being stretched, and there are multiple images. Uh, there are this, this system right here has little globular clusters forming stars uh, around it. Uh, so m many theses will come out of this picture. And again, this, this was a test image that we wanted to take just so we could say, does it work? And but this, this was like about a 12-hour time exposure, and I believe right. a similar image, not as deep, from Hubble took 10 days. So yes. that gives you an idea of the kind of yeah. uh, power that you have in this instrument. Right. We had always uh, talked in, in literature before the launch that we'd be about 100 times more powerful than Hubble, and uh, we've seen it in action here. Delivered. So, yeah. All right. So those were some of the images that came out, uh, the so-called early release observations, but uh, we've been doing a lot of other things since then. Uh, the main science program is underway for Webb. It started right after July 12th. Uh, this is one of the images that uh, came out, uh, a picture of Jupiter. Again, now this is a, an infrared picture. You can see that the great red spot is white in this picture, uh, but it's the same phenomenon. It's very bright in the infrared. You can see the aurora on the north and south pole. Uh, but what I love about this is the telescope is, again, it's so big and so powerful that we're actually getting diffraction 
off the aurora. It's, it's, this is so bright, it's actually blurring uh, itself out. But you can see the rings of Jupiter here. Uh, and then you can see a couple of smaller moons. But the other thing that I love about this picture is that there's a name, these two names down here. These are what we, you might call citizen scientists, laypersons, who they just love getting space data and processing it to make it look beautiful, being accurate. So when we say web is science for all, this isn't, these aren't NASA people doing that. Well, it's worth pointing out that anybody in this room can submit. It's, it's a totally blind process. They don't have no idea where they come from. You can submit a proposal to get some time on web. So you kids out there get busy. A little, little project for school. I, you'll probably get an A if you get some time on the way. Not, on, not only will you get an A, you'll get some funding. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. So what are some of the other things? Ah, you, uh, you had earlier said about taking spectra of right. exoplanets. Right. So uh, this is now from a program, and, and you know it's a spectrum, so it requires a little bit of explanation here. But the, the takeaway is that bump, the big blue bump that you see there, is carbon dioxide in the atmosphere of another world. So with Webb, we are going to be looking at other planets to see do they have atmospheres that would be conducive to life. It's unlikely we'd be able to detect direct signatures of life with Webb, but we'll be able to say, oh, you know, there's a planet, it's temperate, it's got, you know, it's got some methane, carbon dioxide, it's a place that could host life. And, and that's, that'll be a moment that changes humanity forever. What's that instrument going to look like that would work in parallel to, to get that answer, do you think? Uh, it'll probably be some uh, combination of uh, our mid-infrared uh -huh. spectrograph and some of our near-infrared spectrographs. They'll work in tandem because if you see something in the, uh, say, the near-infrared and says, you know, I think this looks like uh, methane, well, methane has a signature in the mid-infrared too, so let's check it there and verify. So that this is just a, uh, a near-infrared uh, spectrum. It's a very small piece of the spectrum. Uh, and all, all the lines are models of different constituents of an atmosphere, and they can add and subtract them to try to fit the points. The dots are the, the actual detections from Webb. And you can see that the system that has uh, carbon dioxide in it and, and those other uh, elements fits it well. But uh, as a scientist, the thing we love are the things that don't fit our models. So right now, people are talking about this. Here is a little bump that doesn't come from all of these things. So there's something else in the atmosphere that we need to find out what that is. So you have no idea. You don't I, know what that I, thing I, is. I'm not an exoplanet person, yeah. so I have no idea. There may be really? people who have clues, but I don't. Wow. Wow. Now, and this is one of the. Uh, we have the early release science programs. This is one of their targets, and so they, they've got papers in the, you know, they're in the preprint archive. I mean, when, when you hear scientists like you say, I don't know, that's exciting, right? That's, uh, that, that's you know everything, right? I mean, see. <laughs> we build these things to find out, like, well, why doesn't that work? Yeah, yeah. You know you're yeah. in the right place when you say, I don't know, right? <laughs> Now, this was actually uh, another one of the early release observations from the Canadian instrument, and uh, it showed water in an atmosphere of an exoplanet. Uh, and this was a system that uh, both of these exoplanets were known to exist. We didn't, Webb didn't discover them, uh, but it was our checkout. Uh, and so we confirmed uh, some hints of water that Hubble had seen, but this fit the model so well, it was like, okay, there's no doubt anymore. What are some other things we've seen here? Some of their latest and greatest. This is the center of a grand design spiral, uh, M74, Messier 74, face-on uh, spiral. Uh, I, I just love this picture. It looks like a, you can almost hear it. It looks hmm. like a maelstrom. Hmm. Uh, but this is a combination of, again, mid-infrared data and uh, near-infrared data. That, that blue color, is that, is that kind of a false color, or is that really the color you think? Uh, the way they code the colors in these uh, are just the, the same scale, in a sense, that mm -hmm. they use on Hubble. So redder things are longer wavelengths, okay. bluer things so are shorter cool. wavelengths. Okay. Yeah. Uh -huh. 
So in these little red pockets that you see are star forming regions and these are older stars right in the center. What's the next one in the rogues gallery here? Ah, so not only can we look at an exoplanet to get a spectrum of it, if the planet is far enough from its star, we can actually take a picture of it. Now it's just a point source for us. We don't actually see anybody waving back. Uh, <laughs> but here you see four different wavelengths, two from the near-infrared camera and two from the mid-infrared camera of, again, a known exoplanet. And this is testing out one of our coronagraphs. And a coronagraph is an instrument that works just like when, you know, if you put your hand up to block the sunlight, if something's too bright, you want to block the light to see something near it, coronagraph works in the same way. So we put our uh, dark spot over the star, which is represented uh, by, this is where the star is in, in the actual image, and you can see this planet. Now, the, the, the structure you see here is, is just a function of the optics of the telescope. It, it's just a point source, so the planet doesn't look like that. Uh, and, and this system is quite wide, uh, but it does tell us that uh, web will be used to take actual pictures of planets and systems and not just spectrum. I think I've got a couple more. Uh, another uh, beautiful image uh, of a galaxy that has undergone a merger or a collision. It's known as a cartwheel galaxy for pretty obvious reasons. Uh, and, and again, there's a lot of uh, dust is, is making all these uh, spidery or filamentary structures uh, and this was a spiral galaxy that had another galaxy collide with it. The, the colliding galaxy is, is either consumed or, or behind in this, you know, behind relative to our view here, so, so we don't see that. So th those are some pictures that have already come out. But we will be releasing uh, observations nearly every day now. Science, you know, our scientists are putting data out. Uh, they can you know, go through NASA or they can go out on their own. We encourage them to go through the agencies because we can uh, help magnify their, uh, um, their reach. If you follow these sources here, you'll stay up uh, with the latest and greatest. And, uh, we are just beginning, and we have an amazing machine. I'm really looking forward to what's next. We ain't seen nothing yet. Eric, yeah. and, wow, congratulations. <laughs> so let's, um, let's just spectacular, fabulous on so many levels. You don't have to be a scientist to love what you see here. I know you guys are crazy. All right, Anne, we have some questions from the audience. Okay. And there's we some up front too, too, I think. Considering the distance, if you have to fine tune something, how long does it take to send the command and how long do you have to wait to find out if it worked? Oh, it's, it's just uh, the light travel time is just a few seconds up and back there. So uh, it's almost real time, uh, but there is a slight delay. So, yeah. I read, uh, I guess it was some weeks ago, that a micrometeorite hit the web. This was very concerning, <laughs> frankly, to me, because if one could hit it, innumerable micrometeorites could hit it. What are you doing about that? And, 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 <laughs> and, and the other point was, is it true that the telescope is turned at a certain angle? whereby it is being protected from the solar wind, or did I misread that? Okay, so uh, there are two, two parts to the question. I'll answer the second part first uh, about the solar wind. Uh, because the sun shield always is oriented towards the sun, uh, the solar wind is effectively blocked by the sun shield. But now micrometeoroids, uh, we knew we were, were getting hit by them all the time. That was in fact part of the design uh, criteria was that we had to have a certain optical quality at the so-called end of life, which is, you know, formally we had to pick a number, so at five years, and there were models of 
how many dust particles there are and what's the spectrum of their size. And so we took that into account and that told us we essentially had to polish the mirror smoother than uh, it needed to be uh, to start so that by the time it got hit with all these micrometers, it would still be where we needed to be at the end of life. So you saw in, in the press there was a, a larger micrometeor. And by the way, by large, I mean something that you couldn't even see with your eye. Um, but it is moving incredibly fast. And so it made uh, you know, a, a, an impression on the mirror. But even with that, we are still twice as good as we needed to be. So the people who made it put together a system that was so fantastic that even with this uh, hit, we're still exceeding requirements. And even that large hit was a, a kind that we predict about once a year. And so, you know, maybe we got ours early. But you said earlier your, your life has been extended because you had such a good launch. Does that change your equation? And, and did the micrometeoroids become a life limiter at the end as opposed to the fuel? I, I think what will ultimately be a life limiter or, or is the kind of thing that gets almost every space mission in the end. Some piece of electronics gives out or, or you know, an instrument stops working in some way. Uh, even after we would run out of fuel, say after 20 some years, and we don't station keep and we begin to drift, we don't need to turn the instruments off. So I, there will be some of Webb that can operate for as long as we decide we want to fund the, the work. Oh. I'm getting some questions from online also. And as far as the sun shield goes, how can you prepare for, how have you prepared for anything hitting that? Uh, there are five layers to the sun shield. Uh, part of the reason there are five and not three or two. So it's like heavy duty aluminum foil, I guess. Is, it, yeah, is to, uh, we know these micrometeoroids, they'll hit the primary mirror, they'll hit the sun shield. The first, one, first layer, they'll just go straight through it but then it becomes almost like birdshot. It gets broken up and so now you have finer particles hitting a second one. They may or may not make it through. So the, and then there are three more layers. So you just don't want something to go all the way through because then it creates a hole. But so long as you have some blocking, you're still uh, okay. So I was curious about the hexagonal honeycomb shape of the mirrors, but as I was thinking about my question, I also was thinking if the telescope got 15 years out, if it looked back at Earth, would you possibly see future or past being that distance is time? <laughs> so a uh, couple of things on that. It, the, the time distance between, you know, that it takes radiation to get from Earth to L2 is so small that you're only, you would only see a couple of seconds into the past. Uh, but the, uh, the shape of the mirrors comes from, uh, that's an optimal way to fill, to pack and fill uh, uh, any kind of two-dimensional surfaces with hexagons. And so that's why that design uh, was chosen. All right, so what is next? Are, what, are there any plans for the future? Uh, so what's next? Uh, well, I'll talk about what's next for Webb and then what's next after Webb. Uh, so Webb uh, has a yearly cycle where people can write proposals. The next cycle's coming up. I think the call will go out in November. Proposals can come in in January. So get busy, folks. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Christmas break, writing the proposals. Uh, and, and this call will go out every year. And what we see over time is uh, as certain kinds of science, we, we say the cream gets skimmed off the top early, the way the investigations people change over time. And so we expect to see that on Webb like other telescopes. Uh, so Webb, like Hubble, uh, looks at a very small piece of the sky. In fact, its field of view is about one ten millionth of the whole sky. So think about those deep pictures where you get tens of thousands of galaxies in one ten millionth mm -hmm. of the sky. Mm -hmm. The telescope that comes after Webb is called the Nancy Grace Roman Space Telescope. It looks a lot like Hubble. In fact, it's got the same size mirror as Hubble, but it's got an enormous field of view. And so it will scan the sky. It's 100 times field of view. Boom, boom, boom. Looking for rare objects because you find rare things by looking at huge swaths all at once. If you tried to do it one ten millionth of the sky at a time, it would take too long. 
And then the thing that I'm working on is the thing that comes after Nancy Grace Roman next. So mm -hmm. that, that'll be a telescope that is going to find life. Ah. Yeah. Okay, so, um, so my question, I actually have two short questions, hopefully. Um, I was reading the other day that they had seen galaxies that were only 200, only 200 million years after the Big Bang, but they were surprised by what they saw, that they were more developed than they expected. So maybe you can uh, comment on that. The other thing is the idea of finding the signature for life. And I, I think the free oxygen is the easiest, is the, um, the molecule that's, that, that indicates life. Does the infrared pick that up? Because I know CO2 and water, that's, those are the greenhouse gases, mm -hmm. right? That's infrared. <laughs> the, the, uh, is O2 transparent to infrared? Uh, so, so we'll start with the, the oxygen question. The, the way we would probably look for it is to see if we could see ozone, O3. Uh, so you can see it has an infrared signature. It also has signatures in the visible. But that's one molecule we don't know that we could get the sensitivity with. It would be fantastic if we could, but I don't know that, we'll be, I don't know that we're optimized for that. Uh, and the, and you know, your first question about... Uh, the earliest galaxies. So, so you're right. Some of these, the things with the most distant redshift, are beginning to bump right up against where theorists say we should see the first galaxies. And we haven't really looked. We haven't done our deep field yet. So, you know, is there tension there? Well, maybe the, the start. Uh, no, no one is saying, oh, you know, everything's wrong and we got to start over again. But there's enough uh, interest there that, uh, you know, may maybe we have seen that first thing this quickly, uh, but that's why we built the telescope. Uh, hi. So I had a simple question, and then I, I just went on a trip of dimensions. So I'm, try <laughs> I'm going to try and keep this, I'm trying to get back to Earth here. So you're saying we're looking back in time simply because the time that it takes light travel to, to travel to get to that machine. Okay. So when we're looking back in time, pointed toward the source of the Big Bang, what we're actually looking at is sort of back in time at the newest offspring of the Big Bang. That's one question. And if that's true, then to really discover the origins of the Big Bang, you would have to actually look in the other direction, where the, the, of the earliest creations of the Big Bang, which are actually in the other direction of the Big Bang. From, okay, and then the next question is, if that's true, <laughs> if that's true, then you're never going to be able to capture that, what that looked like, because it's already past us. You can't get to the origins of what that ever looked like. So the, the, the final then question is, <laughs> is the only, is the oldest, is the oldest evidence of the Big Bang that's that's possible to know actually where we are right now? I, I will say the answer to your last Did that make sense? Yeah, uh, the answer to your last question is yes. We have seen the cosmic microwave background radiation. It permeates all space. It is uh, what we call the surface of last scattering. What do I mean by that? Before, when the universe was very hot, and uh, electrons and photons and, and protons. It was just a sea. The, the light couldn't escape. Uh, but as the universe was expanding and cooling, eventually there became enough space in between electrons that the, the photons could escape. And those photons are what we see all around us as the three degree, 2.7 Kelvin background. So. The Big Bang didn't, you can't go out to the sky and go over there. That's where the big, it, it, it created space. So space is all around us. And, and that's, it's a non-intuitive concept. So the way we would know we're seeing a first galaxy, uh, there are two methods actually. One would be to uh, find some little smudge of a galaxy and take a spectrum and then just like that spectrum showed, uh, there was neon and argon and those heavy elements. Uh, all those elements are made in stars. The Big Bang only made hydrogen, helium, a little bit of lithium. So if you see a spectrum of a galaxy that has no heavy elements, you could say, well, that, that thing is made of only the material 
that formed in the, you know, right out of the Big Bang. So that, that would be one way. That's sort of the ultimate, uh, you know, the holy grail. Might be the toughest way. The other way is to just simply count. Look deep into space. How many faint galaxies do you see? Just take a deeper image. How many faint? Uh, at some point, if you see the number just drop off, you know you're looking, you're taking longer exposures, you're not seeing anything. It's because nothing's there. So at that distance from us, which translates to a time, we know there's not, there are no galaxies for us to see. So that's when galaxies formed. I'm sorry, you're saying the Big Bang actually created space? Yes. The content in space? Both. Hey, thank you. Super interesting. Um, going from the theoretical to the practical direction, uh, <laughs> what would you say the stickiest or most interesting engineering challenges were that the teams had to overcome in order to make this possible? Uh, I think the there were two engineering disciplines that were really stressed on this telescope, uh, thermal engineering and mechanical engineering. Uh, the mechanical engineering, it, it's kind of obvious. This thing had to unfold and uh, do all these things while it was extremely cold. So, no, you know, everything's a solid at these temperatures. So, you have to use dry lubricants. Uh, the mechanisms had to work the first time. So, mechanically, it was just very challenging from a reliability standpoint. Thermally, it was challenging because we want to keep everything on that cold side very cold. Now, while the hot side, just a few feet away, is 600 degrees Fahrenheit. So uh, we had to keep the thermal engineers, certainly not me, had to keep track of how milliwatts of energy moved through this system to make sure they knew where it was all going. And then, so those were two disciplines. And then the final thing was Webb is big enough, we could never test it fully deployed on Earth. Uh, normally, when you build a spacecraft, the uh, uh, mantra is test as you fly. Test it just like it's going to be in space. There's no place we could deploy this and test it on Earth. So we tested it in two halves, compared the computer models of the other half, and said, yeah, it'll work. Uh, and it did. So, so that's, a, that's a paradigm breaker for us, is we now can launch things based purely upon our compute ability. Um, following that train of thought, uh, how, how repeatable is the success and the launch of Hub, considering that there were 300 some odd singular points of failure and everything had to work just so? Mm -hmm. You have all these different plans for the future. Um, I guess what's, how can you repeat that? Yeah, so, so I know that, uh, you know, engineers, they're constantly looking to improve their designs. And so the engineers who will build what comes after, the, we'll leave Nancy Grace Roman out for a moment because it's a completely different design. But the next deployable telescope people are already thinking about, and one of the things they're saying is, we don't want to be that complicated. So uh, they're beginning to think, are there ways you can modularize perhaps the construction of it uh, so that you could have it self-assemble in some way? Uh, we probably won't design a system ever, like this ever again. It's kind of the nature of science experiments. You, you do them once, they achieve their results, and you don't run well, them again. Is it possible, Eric, to do it in a distributed way? In other words, a lot of little telescopes that are communicating with each other and, and have the, the net power of a much bigger one? Is that possible? Yeah, we, we call those interferometers. Mm -hmm. uh, they do it all the time with radio dishes on the Earth. If you've ever seen those pictures out in the yeah. desert of the radio dishes, they act like one big telescope, but they're sparse. Uh, people have talked about doing that in space. Uh, that is probably uh, a challenge beyond the, the, the deployed kind of telescopes because you have to you essentially know your position to within a fraction of your wavelength and the timing has to be precise. So. No, no GPS out there for it. <laughs> Hi, um, really fascinating. Thank you so much for all of this information, it's amazing. Um, so one of the things that I kind of, like I read about, like my understanding is that kind of what you were trying to do was sort of get clearer photos from what you've had from Hubble. Um, my question to you is what have you seen that completely surprised you, something that you didn't expect to see or that you just weren't sure that you were going to get? 
Uh, let's see. For me, that picture of the Carina Nebula, the one that looked like a mountain, uh, the sharpness of that edge in the picture really stunned me. Uh, because I've, I, that's not my science, but I've seen those nebular pictures, and they always have these beautiful uh, sort of artistic oil painting diffuse edge, and that thing is a knife edge, and that really uh, surprised me. And I said that to somebody who studied stars, and they said, oh, you know, we thought that this is what it would look like when we saw these PAHs, polycyclic, and, and so they got to see what they had always been thinking about, and so that confirmed for them, blew me away. So we have a, a question from online, and they're saying, um, do your mirrors have any wipers on them? What happens if they get three <laughs> on them in case of rain? So that was Jenny. Jenny just called in to ask that. Yeah. Uh, on Earth, we actually did wipe the mirrors off. Now, we, you know, we didn't have a squeegee or anything like that, but there was, uh, uh, actually, I think it was one guy from uh, Ball Aerospace who a couple times cleaned that mirror by hand wow. using, using a brushing technique. And uh, th there were times when we had the telescope, it would be tipped over so that it was sort of looking down, and he would be on what we call a diving board and just be under there for hours cleaning wow. that off. And, and you may think, wow, that sounds like a hideous job. But part of the reason we're so amazing is because that guy did an unbelievable job. He's a regular Michelangelo. It's amazing. <laughs> wow. Wow. Um, I uh, wanted to ask you about the Big Bang. Um, it's, uh, it, does that mean that there, all of those gases and everything that were in a ball exploded, they all coagulated and then exploded and created our universe? Does that mean that we are just one universe or is there another place, like could be another universe that had their own ball? <laughs> There are theories of physics, uh, and there, you may hear the term multiverse, that there is more than you know, one domain of the universe, and we could never communicate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. okay. that, that, was, that was the multiverse contacting us. Uh, <laughs> So, so there are some theories of physics that say that indeed uh, could happen. Now, the, the trick for a scientist is if we can never get information from those, uh, we can never mes measure it or test it. So is it, you know, is it just theoretical or is it scientific? And so could we, could yeah. we all be in a terrarium on God's desk? Yeah. Is that possible? <laughs> So he, he, he should turn the temperature down. It's getting warm here in the terrarium. Hi. Thank you so much for all your intelligence and insights. Um, very curious about the exoplanets, and you mentioned that your, the project after the next one that you're working on might be the one that finds life. Like, what exactly are you looking for? I know about the ozone, you mentioned that, but... One is, what are you looking for? The second part is, do you have a team of people at NASA that are looking at specific exoplanets and monitoring them on a continuous basis rather than just getting a snapshot at one, one point in time? Yeah, um, there are multi parts to that uh, excellent question. So there are not only people at NASA, we have an exoplanet exploration program office at JPL. So there are folks who this is what they do all the time. There are citizen scientists who have programs to monitor uh, known exoplanets to see the dip in brightness of the star as the planet goes in front of them. So this is really a worldwide effort to monitor and find targets. And what this next telescope will launch in 2040 or something like that, uh, it will be a visible and near-infrared telescope. Uh, the thing that will make it different from Webb is that it has to have a super stability uh, so we can control the surface of Webb's uh, mirror to one nanometer, one billionth of a meter, kind of the size of an atom. We can know where that surface is. To study exoplanets, to, you, you will want to shape 
the mirror to picometers. So a thousand times, you know, a thousandth of an atom need to control the surface of that mirror. That's the technology and then keeping the thing stable that has to be invented between now uh, and when we launch. And uh, I used to think, you know, these things sound impossible. But you, when you challenge engineers, they're like, oh, yeah, let me add that. So, <laughs> yeah. We're just going to take two more questions. So here we go. Sorry, I forget how long you said it took to design. Uh, so let's see. We, depending on, there are many times you could say web started. What I like to think of in, in 1995, NASA headquarters sent a request to Goddard Space Flight Center to do a study for a next generation space telescope that was optimized for the infrared. So, so I say that was like, you know, some official bureaucratic starting gun. Uh, and then we awarded the main contract to, uh, it was TRW, they got bought by Northrop Grumman in 2002. So, you know, some early designs in the late 90s, you know, big, big money starts flowing in 2002. So 20 years at a minimum, 30 years at the outside. I guess my question is, can you talk a little bit about how you design something over that period of time, knowing that technology is going to change so much over that ah, 30 years? Yeah. And also at what point you acknowledge that you just have to bake in certain aspects of the design and it's going to be redundant or not as good as you would I didn't mean to interrupt you, but it did, it, was, it did come in way over budget. We're not complaining because yeah. we, we, we got good payoff here. Yeah. But uh, it's almost impossible to predict if you have to invent things along the way, right? So how, right. how do you do that? You're building the airplane in flight. Yeah, right? yeah, that, uh, it's a good analogy. Uh, as you, it's a very iterative process. And so you first say, well, I, you know, I may need my telescope to be bigger than Hubble and has to work at the infrared. So you make a design and it's, it's four meters and, and it goes to six microns. And then you tell the scientists, well, this is what it can do. And they say, hmm, okay, that's, it's better than what we have, but, you know, it, the mirror needs to be bigger. And then at some point, oh, now it won't fit in a rocket anymore, so we have to break it up. Uh, and so it's this iterative process uh, that we run through. But you're right, at some point, uh, you just say, well, I, I can't keep waiting for that next uh, CPU that, that's going to be even better because this one that I have now, it, it meets my requirements. And so you freeze it then. It, does it mean you're flying 15-year-old technology? Yeah, but, but it meets your requirements. I, I'm sorry to say, but I think we're out of time at this point. But I want you all to join me in thanking both Eric and Miles. I don't know if you realize how, how fortunate we are, because this is everything you wanted to know about the Webb Telescope, but had the opportunity to ask. So thank you all for coming. You've been an incredible audience. Thank you, Eric. Thank you, Miles. This is spectacular. Thank you, Natasha, Luis, and everybody else. We'll see you on Monday for Climate Week, and thank you so much for coming. Good night.